Good afternoon and welcome virtually to Old Dominion University and its remote experience for young engineers and scientists program known as Reyes. My name is Giovanna Gennard, Assistant Vice President for Strategic Communication and Marketing and Co-Chair of Reyes and I will serve as your host for today's event on becoming a Chief Information Security Officer or CISO featuring Laura Diener. The purpose of the Global Reyes program is to offer free virtual learning experience that increase science literacy, inspire and train future generations of STEM age students. Today's discussion with Laura Diener offers us insight into the professional journey of a leading chief information security officer at Fortune 500 companies. Throughout this webcast, you may submit questions through the Q&A box on your Zoom screen and following the lecture, we will answer as many of your questions as time allows. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Laura Diener. Laura, would you please turn on your microphone and video so we can see you and you have already done that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm astute. Hi, it's Absolutely. great to be here. <laughs> so Laura Diener is the first female CISO in Northwestern Mutual's history. As Vice President and CISO, she's responsible for spearheading their information security strategy. Laura has more than 21 years of leadership experience protecting multinational corporations from cybersecurity threats. She is a board member of the Financial Services Information Sharing Analysis Center and was co-chair of the Global Futures Council on Cybersecurity for the World Economic Forum, ladies and gentlemen. So most recently, Laura served as a CISO at S&P Global. Prior to that, she held numerous leadership roles at Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and PR Newswire. We are very, very proud of the fact that Laura is an Old Dominion University alumna, where she started her career working as tech support while she earned a bachelor's degree in computer science. Of note also, she was featured in Woman No Cyber, 100 Fascinating Females Fighting Cybercrime. Please join me in welcoming our very own Laura Diener to Reyes. Hey, <laughs> thank you so much for that introduction, Diavana. That was amazing. I really appreciate it. Um, it's sometimes just really um, just humbling to hear my own journey. So thank you for highlighting all of those things. And of course, I'm very proud to be from Norfolk, Virginia, uh, grew, grew up there, um, and also being a part of the Old Dominion University family. So thank you. Um, so I do have a presentation, uh, Orlando, if you don't mind sharing. Thank you so much, Orlando, I really appreciate it. Uh, so a little bit about me, I'm gonna talk about my career path uh, to becoming a CISO, or sometimes we like to call that CISO. Um, and, and then uh, maybe give you guys some advice if you're thinking about getting into cybersecurity and of course Q&A. Uh, so next slide, if you don't mind. Thank you. So, so a lot of people ask me, you know, how did I get here? And you know, I wanna talk a little bit about my family. Uh, so I was actually born in Morocco, I'm Moroccan. Uh, my father was in the US Navy and he was actually stationed all around the world, but he spent a lot of time in Morocco um, and then eventually uh, became uh, stationed there where he met my mother. Um, and he, you know, some people say, how'd you get in cyber? Well, he was an electronics technician. Uh, and if you see that encryption system there, that is in the, I believe, NSA museum. <laughs> uh, and he worked on something like that, uh, that's in the museum now. Very different from our encryption systems today, but I think the concept still holds. Um, and that doesn't mean that he got me into encryption. It just means that, you know, his, his, uh, his pushing on asking questions, being curious and, you know, always just trying out things to see what happens. That definitely was something that I felt uh, was instilled on me and my, my brothers. Um, of course, we moved to Norfolk, which is important for this audience. Of course, uh, we moved to Norfolk in 1985. Um, and uh, believe it or not, my mother became a, a merchant marine uh, during our time there. So that's the, the ship she was on, which I believe is retired somewhere. Uh, and she was uh, stationed uh, at one of the many bases, of course, in Norfolk. But I would actually remember when I was going to ODU, dropping her off uh, so that she can uh, join uh, the USNS Sirius and go on her journeys uh, periodically. So next slide. 
I guess you can say I was born into it, right? I don't know. Um, so a little bit more. Uh, so yes, grew up in Norfolk. So Lake Taylor woo -woo, uh, is where <laughs> I went to high school. I went to Rosemont Middle School and I went to Larry Moore uh, Elementary School. So this is all in Norfolk, if you don't know, uh, and uh, had a wonderful childhood there. Uh, as you can see, uh, from the schools, they're not small, uh, so you know was always around a lot of wonderful diversity, and that's something I love talking about when I talk about Norfolk, Virginia. When I'm here in Brooklyn, New York, uh, we have plenty of diversity here, but I feel uh, that Norfolk really has that uniqueness, and so um, I wanted to call call attention to it and give it a shout out. Uh, so next slide. Um, and so what's it, what is it like for me at ODU? Uh, obviously computer science major. Uh, it was very challenging. I can tell you that um, there's plenty of times where I just could not get my code to compile in the CS lab. Uh, very frustrating, uh, but you know, I, I kept pushing. Um, and you know, that ambition and that determinedness is super important in any technology field um, because uh, as long as you can persevere through it, you'll be able to figure it out. Um, you see that picture there. Uh, I actually did have somebody ask me if it was my boyfriend's computer. Um, that's not a joke uh, while I was getting my CS degree. Um, and so I'm, I'm calling attention to that because I think I was one of five in that computer science class that are, were uh, women identifying. Um, and so, so if you are in computer science or thinking about it, just think about the fact that you know everybody is coming with their own diverse skill set and um, and to make them feel welcome, you know, not 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 welcome. <laughs> uh, and then of course, uh, you know, compiling. Yeah, I got through all of the compilations and all of those late nights with uh, Cal. So I had to give a good shout out to Cal's uh, all the wings, all the subs, all the pizzas. Uh, definitely got me through those nights. Um, and then on the next slide, just gonna, again, talk, talk about a little bit more on um, just the next slide on uh, the notions. So I say being a chick in CS, or maybe a little bit controversial, but the CMBC comic has this great uh, comic that talks about um, if you if you kind of fast forward at the end, why are there no why are there so few girl engineers? Well. That's because of society. We have to think about that, right? We have to think about what we're doing um, as parents or as caregivers or ourselves to be welcoming, right? If your, um, you know, female identifying uh, students want to get into security, but everybody kind of has this notion that they should have a doll, well, you know, uh, it's we're we're kind of part of the problem. So I encourage everyone to really think about that and think about what you can do to make sure that there's more females joining the field of technology, joining STEM subjects, even in, in as young as middle school, elementary school, and then making sure that they understand that there is a whole community and it's it's possible for for anyone regardless of uh, how they identified uh, from a gender perspective. Uh, so next slide. Uh, okay, so working, working there. Uh, so um, shout out to Professor McGarry, Brian McGarry. So I actually worked for Brian uh, at the um, College of Engineering and Technology, and I was tech support. Uh, and I got to do wonderful things. That I honestly never had the opportunity to, um, you know, my family, uh, we lived, uh, you know, meagerly, I guess is the best way of putting it. I spent a lot of time in libraries, but I never had a computer of my own. Um, and I, I got this wonderful opportunity as, um, you know, under Professor McGarry's wing uh, as this technician to get to take apart computers, to fix computers, um, you know, to really problem solve, honestly, on a hardware perspective, but also software. So I, I did actually get to have lots of conversations with different professors who are having some problems with their either internet connection or something like that. And I really grew a lot, just, just practical experience um, and so I, I really encourage everyone, if you have an opportunity to work somewhere, just do it because it's really helpful to, to get that practical experience. Um, of course, that experience with Professor McGarry got me experience as an intern at uh, North, uh, sorry, Newport News Shipbuilding, which I think is called North of Grumman now, but um, I worked there in Newport News uh, for a, a bit of time. Um, and I got to, again, just hands-on experience, practical, wearing a hard hat, I had steel toe boots, I got to do a lot of things uh, related to the field of technology. I wasn't in security in any of, the, any of these uh, situations that I were in, but I was certainly thinking about 
problem solving, thinking about um, you know how technology works, how the internet works, the OSI model, what an IP address is, right? So I got to do so much hands-on experience there, uh, and uh, and it, it was just fascinating to to be able to get paid for something I was actually really enjoying. Uh, so again, if you get a chance, I know ODU is great about internships. Definitely do it. Um, again, it's a wonderful experience, uh, and it really helped my career. Next slide. And so then I left. I left Norfolk. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, I had to leave. <laughs> I got my first job as a consultant at a security operations center at a big financial services company. Um, and that company um, had an enormous, um, you know, wall of monitors where I had to just constantly look at these beeping and flashing lights and, and determine what was something happening. Now, Security Operations Center, for, for those of you that don't know, you know, it's really important that you follow up on those uh, alerts that are happening on a regular basis. It can be very stressful, honestly. You can be in the middle of it, things are happening, you're trying to you know, figure out what's going on, um, but it's also amazing experience because you really learn things that you probably aren't taught in uh, you know, traditional uh, education in computer science or computer engineering. You're really learning how to deal with the stress and the, and the situations that occur in real time. And again, that's invaluable. So that experience was, was wonderful and I certainly needed it. <laughs> so on my next slide. Um, so I was there and then I went to another financial services at, a, at, a, at another big bank. Uh, again, I'm not going to say where, but you could probably figure it out. Um, and it was uh, the first time I was really engaged more in business. All the times that I had roles or jobs, I was mostly doing hands-on technical work. Um, but this was the first time I got to actually get really engaged in business. And I, I have to tell you again, it was phenomenal because you should know why you're doing what you're doing every single day. Like, what is the business of a bank? Why is it important to protect it if you decide to get in security? Or even if you're a, a technologist, why is it important to have so much technology? And it was eye-opening for me to really sit and listen to how the business is working um, and how I'm playing a part in that, even if it was a large firm. Um, and then of course it got bigger because it merged with another company. Um, and that was a time of uncertainty to me, for me, um, because you know, when you merge with another company or there's acquisitions, uh, unfortunately things happen, like people get laid off, uh, your friends may get laid off and those kinds of things. So it, it was scary. I had to you know, think about those emotions of fear and just be open and honest with that, but it also opened up opportunities for me. <laughs> Um, as, as odd as that sounds, when you're in the middle of something like that, you will find another opportunity. It's not like you won't, right? So in that situation, that's exactly what happened. So on the next slide, you'll see, I did uh, move on <laughs> to another company, uh, a big financial services on Wall Street. Um, and that's, you know, downtown New York City that you see there. And I, again, I was there for eight years. I had so much learning there. Uh, so many opportunities, so much support to learn continuously. Um, and even I had the opportunity to manage a global team to spend time in another country. And in this case, I spent four months on a major project in London. Um, and again, working for a really great company, this is what you get, right? You get, you get to get immersed, you get to get support and you get to possibly even get the opportunities to travel the world. Um, and again, I'm just so thankful that I got to do that uh, here at this uh, you know, Wall Street based uh, company. Um, while I was in London, however, <laughs> I should tell you, I was pregnant. <laughs> uh, and when I got back, uh, obviously uh, had my first child. So on the next slide, you'll actually see an, an older picture. <laughs> um, my, my kids are older now. This, these are some younger pictures, but I had Zane there is on the right in the green shirt and that's Aiden in the red shirt. Um, and, and, I, and I bring this up, you know, it, it is very personal, but I, I think it's also important for you to know that life can happen while you're actually having a career. Uh, and, that, and that's exactly what happened to me. I, again, I was in a wonderful company uh, who was very supportive of not just my career, but my life. <laughs> and I was able to take, um, you know, leave, maternity leave or paternal leave. Um, and I was able to come back and still continue uh, and, and manage a global team and learn new things and take other opportunities. 
Um, and so again, parting advice is just don't think that you have to have one or the other. You can do both. It's not easy. I'm not going to say it is, but you can. So next slide. Um, so those are Zane and Aiden, right? So I, I still continued, obviously, um, but I did decide, um, you know, if, if I was going to if I was going to be somewhere, um, I needed to figure out where that somewhere was. And for me, it was at some point in that financial services company, I decided I was going to be a, a chief information security officer or CISO. Um, I had managed, you know, global teams. I understood lots of different cultures. I had a lot of learning. I have to tell you, I, I, I didn't know everything about the world. Um, you know, even even with my my father's Navy past and, and being born in Morocco, I still had to make sure I had a good sense before I felt like I could take that kind of leap. Um, and then, of course, I had to really sharpen not just my my you know technical skills, but I had to sharpen a, a really solid understanding of the business and what business I wanted to go into. And so I just had to kind of soul search on do I want to be a CISO? Is this the right thing for Laura? Is this the right thing for Laura's family? And what is it do I need to do to get there, right? Not everybody wants to be a CISO, so I'm not saying everybody should. It, it is very stressful, but you know, you do have to take the, the moment to figure out what, what is going to make you feel like your whole self and uh, is there and you're complete and this is something that you enjoy doing. You spend a lot of time at work, so you should definitely enjoy it. <laughs> so on the next slide. Uh, so I decided to do it. <laughs> And I took the leap and I became a chief information security officer for a media company. They did go through a major, major breach uh, and before I had joined. And so again, that pressure that I felt in the stock, my first in the beginning of my career, I felt it again. Um, it was there, but I mean, it was there like tenfold because I was in charge of security. A CISO is in charge of the strategy, is in charge of many things. It's a stressful job. And here, what was super important was that I could handle not just the pressure, but also communicate as effectively as possible. I think in the middle of a situation that's a crisis, which, which a breach would be, um, communication is critical. Um, you know, checking your emotions is critical. Uh, so again, tremendous amount of learning at a media company. It was actually the first and only time you'll see that I ventured outside of financial services, but it was worth it because I learned a tremendous amount of how to really handle uh, a big cyber event such as such as the one I had to handle there. Uh, so next slide. And of course, I had more children. <laughs> In the middle of all of that, I decided we we're going to have twins. So um, these are my twins. This is Isaac and Ismail. Uh, and again, this is they're younger in this picture. They're actually six years old now. Uh, and um, again, it's just to say, you know, look, life happens <laughs> and you have to, you have to roll with it. And of course, every time you still have to think about what's important to you and your family, if you have one. Um, and in this case, I was still a CISO. I was, I was still a mother all the time. And, you know, what really got me through all of this is the support system I have. My family that I mentioned earlier, um, my partner, you know, everything there was critical in terms of allowing me to you know, have a career and be a, f a fantastic partner, a fantastic um, parent, um, and still feel very complete. So just wanted to flash this up because my twins look so young in this picture. It's just great. <laughs> Next slide. Um, and so I had the twins. Uh, it was time for me to come back to financial services. And I made this choice because I realized um, I just really enjoy financial services as a business. I had mentioned the business earlier, really important for you to understand it, but also is this the field that you wanna be in? Would you rather do something like in manufacturing? It's totally possible that you might enjoy that more. I took one hiatus outside of financial services and I realized that I, I actually really appreciate it. I appreciate what it's all about. Um, you know, the media company I was in was actually sold. Um, not that that had a, a big reason for why I decided to leave. It was more of, I felt like I had accomplished what I set out to do, which is to help them live through the breach, um, build a, a fantastic cybersecurity program. And then it was time for me to move on to see what my next challenge was going to be. And so I took a much bigger role at a new company, <laughs> um, which definitely presented new challenges for me, regulated company, big global footprint, um, you know, a large, very large team. And then of course more, more threats from you know from from cyber attackers uh, than a media company would have. So back in financial services. So next slide. 
Um, so that was that was the last uh, uh, on my journey. There was one more, which was already announced at the beginning. Um, I left that company after four and a half years, and I've actually joined Northwestern Mutual, as we talked about at the beginning. Um, you know, again, financial services, super important, but also, um, you know, it, it was important that I kept going with all the challenges. Uh, every company I've worked at has been phenomenal. Um, so my main reason for moving on was just simply because it was time again to move on to find another challenge. And again, I've been here for about three and a half months, so it's been phenomenal so far. Um, on a typical day, <laughs> uh, I do love my job. Uh, there isn't a day that's the same. And for some people, that's not all great. But for me, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy you know, not having a mundane, like every single day I'm doing the same thing. It's just me. It's just not, you know, my brain doesn't really work that way. Um, obviously, because I'm a CISO, I have to focus on strategy. I have to plan a lot for resource e expansions, um, look at different solutions to help for cybersecurity or IT security, uh, whiteboarding architectures, uh, have to look at budget. I swear, I feel like I, I look at budget. I, I make budget decisions or look at a budget like very often, uh, maybe not every day, but definitely a lot just to make sure that I'm staying within a budget. Uh, and then, of course, I'm measuring how well I'm doing there. Uh, security operations centers are still alive. So making sure you're thinking about those things, building them out. If, if you don't already have one, refining them, it's very important. Um, and then thinking about what the critical infrastructure is for a particular company. Um, and then what the IT security infrastructure is to protect that. So again, very, very important to, to, to think about holistically and then part of what an enterprise or a business would need. Um, I like having fun with the training and awareness program. It's actually a really cool way to, to kind of use a different part of your brain um, and, the, and then just, you know, build out what is going to work so that people are feeling the shared responsibility of cybersecurity. Um, and we can have a lot of fun on that. Uh, I do, believe it or not, negotiate le legal contracts. There are some times where maybe um, uh, a particular partner needs to understand that we have um, specific requirements for them around breach notifications, for instance. It's a very typical provision that people put in their contracts. Um, and then, of course, negotiating contracts with with our own um, partnership is, is, a, is a part of the job, not all the time, but definitely part of it. Um, I have to be up to date on any new regulations or any laws that are happening globally, locally, uh, really important to understand what those rules are. Um, of course, writing different company policies against those uh, new regulations are a cool part, I think, uh, of, of what we how we take something that's external and bring it in. Um, I still like to look at code, <laughs> even if I, uh, I had I had a lot of pizza and wings from Cal's uh, <laughs> at ODU. I still enjoy it, but this time I get to look for security flaws, which is really cool. And then of course the coolest part, I think everybody always wants me to talk about is defending against hackers or attackers, um, depending on uh, you know, what's going on in the, uh, in the news or at that point in time, what's the biggest threats. That's my typical day. Definitely not bored. <laughs> Next slide. Um, and so I want to give you guys some advice. So like always, if you've heard anything in my journey, here's some takeaways. Definitely look for opportunities. Work hard. Um, there is no there is no quick path. You have to work hard. Um, you 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 have to put it in, you know, and, and if you can put in the time, you can you can put in the you know, the muscle for it, you will see, you will reap the benefits, you'll see the outcomes of it. Um, make time for family, not just your own family, but like any family that you have around you. You can, you can change that for friends, <laughs> but you should make that time. You know, you're not going to be happy if you're working just all the time. That's just not going to make for a very happy person. <laughs> um, and then, of course, networking. I know you probably hear this, but networking is super important because connections are important um, and you can connect, even if you're an introvert, you can make these connections. Uh, you will find commonality with somebody, but what's important is if you do network, you, you may see an opportunity there or you may learn something, honestly, so get a different perspective. So I think networking is really important. Um, I say know your stuff because I have come across people who like to fake it till they make it. And I don't believe in that. Um, I think even if 
it's an esoteric kind of technology that you don't completely know. If you don't know what Kubernetes is, you can figure it out. <laughs> you just have to put in the time. And that goes back to my second bullet about working hard. Um, you have to know your stuff. And if you don't, it's okay. You should be humble enough to say, I don't know, but I will find out, right? I, I think many people value you understanding your self-awareness than trying to fake it through and then getting caught and then it kind of your integrity kind of goes down so very important to know your stuff do what you love i said this already because you're, you're spending so much time on 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 work it's important to do it be proud of what you're doing be yourself i you know i definitely feel strongly about that last bullet because it's easy for me to leave norfolk virginia and come to brooklyn and try to blend in right that's not me though. <laughs> I'm Norfolk. I'm always going to be Norfolk. And, you know, even if I don't have a Brooklyn accent, it's okay. <laughs> and so the super important advice there for you. And last slide. <laughs> Go Monarchs. <laughs> if, uh, if anybody has questions, I, I put my, my personal email there. Uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Uh, and of course, I just want to thank Everyone here, uh, Reyes, especially, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Very important. Um, and uh, I think I'm passing it over, Giovanna, to you. Sounds great. Well, if you want to just stay with us for a few more minutes, um, yep. we want to thank you again for talking with us about your professional journey as, let me see if I got this right, CISO, correct? A CISO? Yep. Yes, got yes, you got it right. Awesome. <laughs> and how you work, spearheading information security strategy um, to protect multinational corporations from all of these cybersecurity threats. And so now we're getting ready to take questions from our live audience, and we have some really great questions for you. Um, and then to our audience, just a reminder, you can keep keep asking your questions as we go along, and we promise to answer as many as we can. Um, so the first one is, what types of technical and soft skills do you value in candidates when you're hiring people for a position similar to yours? Ashley, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, so I do get that a lot. Uh, you know, I think from a technical skills, let me take them two different ones. So technical skills perspective, it depends on the role, right? So if I'm hiring for a cloud security engineer, I expect you to be an engineer, but also to understand the cloud environment. So I'll be looking for some of those technical skills. Um, on the soft skills side, really important. I'm not a person who feels that you can be a superstar technically, and it's okay if you can't communicate. <laughs> you have to have soft skills, communication, written, oral, every, all those things, organizational, um, prioritization, you should be thinking about all those things, no matter what you're doing, no matter what the role is and how technical you are. That's great advice. I think for any of the STEM fields, right? Yeah. That it's so important to have those communication skills. And that's yeah. something that we're going to be working on at Reyes in the summer to help our students gain too. Um, all right. So how did you strengthen your strategy skills when it comes to protecting a company? Oh, uh, great, great question. Thank you, Simon. Um, so you 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 can do it a couple of ways. Um, I did take uh, I, I I took more courses, believe it or not. So I did go to another university. No offense, or do you? Um, and and I got a, a little bit more of a, a practical experience on business management and strategy. Um, and that was at Dartmouth, uh, and it was about a week long immersion program. So you could do it that way if, if that works well for you. But also, I do it pretty much every day because I have conversations with my network. Uh, so I'd mention the network. It's really important to um, just ask questions like, hey, what are you working on? Um, you know, other CISOs I can talk to on a pretty regular basis and see if they've maybe adopted a strategy that I haven't yet thought of to solve a problem. Um, so just, you know, my, my parting advice again is just always think about it think about what strategies always you know, think not just for you know the tree in front of you but the whole forest just constantly think about that um, and then think about how what what are those ways that you can gain a little bit more knowledge from your network or from from maybe taking some training thanks for that and our next question is related to astronomy so how can it help in astronomy so oh my goodness oh i love this question <laughs> Uh, somebody must know, Juliana, that I like astronomy. So, um, how can I mean technology helps uh, astronomy all the time? I mean, you know what you what you're seeing when you see those pictures. That's all technology, right? So when you see the Mars rover, that's technology. There's an operating system there. I think it's a Linux one. So, so technology already helps astronomy, and it's just more about um, efficiency, right? How how much can you get? 
and gain information and data and how quickly can you process it and how quickly can you get it to its destination and that's all about technology so we're already doing it we got to continue to do it and continue to work on those problems great thanks for that the next question is what's the difference between your job responsibilities when you were working in new york compared to when you were working in london and do you think that they differ or are they still the same Oh, definitely different now because uh, I wasn't a CISO <laughs> either in the in New York with that company or in, in London. Um, you know, the skills were different because I was working on a specific project in London um, and, and my skills there required that I um, have a lot of analytical skills, honestly, because I was doing um, basically a penetration test or a, a code review for a, a major application. Um, and, and then my communication skills are super important because I needed to articulate what the results were. I needed to prioritize them from criticality standpoint. Um, and I needed to articulate those, not just to technologists, but to people who needed to actually do something about it outside of the technology field. Um, and so those skills were very unique for the project that I was on. And of course, when I came back to New York City, I was actually more of a manager. So I wasn't a manager in London. <laughs> I became a manager when I got back as a promotion for my time in London. So those are the big differences. You're great, thanks for that. Yeah. And regarding your major in college, somebody would like to know how difficult Lawrence, computer yeah. science was. Well, listen, sometimes computer science is really easy for people, um, you know, and sometimes it's not. I can tell you that for me specifically, um, I struggled. You know, I struggled with it mostly because um, it was really the first time I was uh, I was working on anything computer science related. Um, like I said, I didn't have a computer. Uh, I didn't. I mean, I looked at books about programming, but once you actually put your hands to keyboard, it's very different. <laughs> and so I struggled, especially those first two years um, in, you know, in, in the programming language classes and, and you know, CS 101. And I struggled, but uh, again, I just, I just kept trying really hard. I, I can tell you, I didn't get great grades, but I just kept, kept trying. Uh, so for me, it was just a little difficult because I had a huge learning curve. So what made you decide to persevere and not give up? Because I know sometimes, you know, when we feel like we're failing, we might, our instincts might be like, ah, oh, maybe computer yeah. science isn't for me. What made I you stay in the major and just kind of dig in and do it? It's such a great follow-up question. I have to tell you, I almost did. I almost gave up. <laughs> um, you know, I, I called my brother Hisham. He was like, you, you, you have to do this. Like, you're the only person in our family from Morocco that's graduating with a computer science degree, and this is going to happen and just keep trying. Um, you know, my father uh, talked to me about, you know, look, you can do this and let's let's think about some strategies that are gonna get you up on that learning curve. My mother constantly encouraged me. So, you know, I had, again, an amazing support group that just kept me positive, even when I was feeling down. <laughs> That's such, thanks again for sharing that, because I know sure. that that's, that's kind of a moment of vulnerability too. And, <laughs> you okay. know, many students, again, struggle, especially with the pandemic, yeah. right? They may not be getting the best grades at the moment. Um, and yeah. so this is good news to know, like, listen, don't give up. You can do this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm glad I did, right? Be like Laura. Yes, yeah, exactly. I'm glad I stuck with it. <laughs> and I'm sure your companies are very happy you stuck with it too. I right? hope so, yeah. <laughs> and so some students too are asking about some of the soft skills again. Mm -hmm. And so this is more like if if somebody's graduating from college and they're looking for more of an entry level position, not not the top position like you have right now. <laughs> Um, yeah. Are there any kind of like unexpected skills in addition? I know you mentioned communication earlier that would give somebody a leg up. Yeah, so tinkering, right? So um, look, you can get a Raspberry Pi for not very much money. Uh, <laughs> you can play around with a, a, you know, a Linux operating system with just, again, some perseverance and determination. Um, so tinker, uh, understand how things are working, understand how you can break it. If you understand how you can break it, maybe you're a pen tester. <laughs> um, you know, if, if you'd rather not do it that way, it's okay to be a software engineer that knows how to solve security problems really well. Um, so if you enjoy doing that, just just tinker. Again, there are um, uh, there's this nonprofit called OWASP, O-W-A-S-P. Um, there's chapters in every city. I know there's one in Norfolk. <laughs> and you can join that chapter and all they do is tinker. So they, <laughs> they just play around with web applications. Uh, and so you can play around with it. There's some great projects on the OWASP website. Uh, you can download them. There's buggy applications. You can try to break it. 
Uh, so, you know, my, my best advice is just play around until you, you determine like, is this really something I want to do? Um, and when you're in the interview process, you know, highlight those, highlight those side projects. It's really important. Thanks for that. Sure. For the next question, I want to ask um, my colleagues in community engagement to see if there's a way to unmute um, Brian Payne so he can ask his question live. I, well, thank you, Giovanna. Am I am I live now? You are. Thank you okay. for joining well, us, Brian. Well, thank you. And uh, at least once or twice a day, I'm talking to myself. So it was nice to know <laughs> that I, I didn't do it that time. Uh, but uh, Laura, this has been fantastic, and we really appreciate it. Uh, uh, but what I was wondering is when when you're hiring graduates fresh out of out of college. What are you looking for? Are there specific courses? Is it their grades? Is it their experience that they've had? And uh, just those sorts of things. Yeah, if I, it's such a great question, Brian. I'm glad you um, you were able to unmute and you were not talking to yourself this time. So thank you. <laughs> um, you know, what, am, what do I look for specifically, especially a college graduate? Um, Grit. I look for grit, right? Uh, can you handle anything that comes at you? And are you positive in the process? And can you run it to the ground? Whatever that problem we're trying to solve, can you just figure it out? Can you? Are you a self-starter that way, right? How much direction do you actually need? Um, because if if you have that grit, like you are going to excel. Um, you're not going to require a ton of uh, extra work, extra handholding. You are going to be phenomenal if the company has like an intern program that you go through. You're going to be phenomenal, phenomenal at every project that they throw at you. So I really like the grit aspect when I when when I get this question. Um, you know, just thinking about how you can just get it done um, as quickly as possible. It doesn't have to be quick, but you know, how can you get it done? Um, and then you know, what what tools do you need to get there? So that's that's the important part. As far as courses, Brian. I don't know. Um, you know, for cybersecurity, believe it or not, we have a deficit of of talent. Um, so we don't necessarily look for a computer science or computer engineering degree anymore. You can actually get in cybersecurity without those things. Um, it's more about what the role is. And so if you're trying to get in for um, cyber defense or incident response or the security operations center, there are plenty of courses designed to get you up to speed on how to handle an incident, what to look for, what the process is, how the industry is doing it. Um, and I mean, and, and of course, there's plenty of conferences. If you've heard of DEF CON or Black Hat or B-Sides, there's all these conferences where you can actually just go do it. You can actually learn how to do it real time. Um, you know, if, if that's the role you want, then we're looking for those kinds of Either you took the course, you understand it, um, you know, or or you're really interested in it. And what what do you need to do to get there? And if you have the grit, the company will probably get you there. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome, Brian. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Brian. And what would you say is the top security uh, cybersecurity threat today? I know that cybersecurity is all over the news, right? Just recently, yeah. there was a a hack that. Uh, basically impacted our pipeline. And so many of us were struggling to find guests so we can go to ODU to work, right? Yeah, I'd say, well, see, so Giovanna, since you're bringing that up, I'd say that the biggest threat then is misinformation because the pipeline was fine. <laughs> Everybody panicked. So, so you, you don't panic, I think is, is my advice there. But as far as like cyber threats, I mean, again, you've seen the news. So the pipeline was a ransomware attack. That is huge right now. Everybody's worried about ransomware. Um, it's it's a it's a really interesting way for criminal hackers to make a lot of money, uh, and they make a lot of money off of this. It's it's. I mean, they even have help desks. I don't know if you guys know that, but you know the the ransomware actors actually have whole help desks to make sure that you're able to pay the ransom <laughs> because it's so profitable, and so many companies wind up doing it. Um, and so that's probably the biggest on my mind right now, but on many other cybersecurity professionals' minds. Um, and then, you know, and I kind of put that in like um, in a bucket of like just criminal activities. Uh, ransomware is actually starting to look a little bit more like nation state actors. And so nation states would be, you know, backed by their government. Um, those are also a huge threat all the time, uh, that doesn't really change. What does change is the tactics that they use to, to actually um, meet their mission, whatever their mission is. 
I'm, I'm still thinking about what you said about how some of these organizations actually have helped us. Like they're actually in customer yeah, they do. service to help Very you helpful. pay the ransom. <laughs> wow. Yes. And, and do you mind, I know that ransomware may, um, some people may be familiar, but for those that are not, do you mind explaining what ransomware means and what such, such an attack is like? Yeah, sure. So ransomware is is a is a way that you know the the attacker can um, can get you can basically just hold a ransom. So it's just an extortion, basically. Um, and so just like ransoms that you, you you might see for like somebody getting kidnapped, this is kind of similar, but it's for data. It's for data itself. And so the attackers will find a way to get that data that maybe you may find really important um, and hijack it through encryption um, and will not give you the key to unlock it until you pay that ransom. And so it's a much like when they say ransom, it is like, so it is a ransom and they're just trying to extort money out of you so that you pay it. Um, and they do that with data. Of course, they find a way to get the data. They again, encrypt it. You, you can't unlock it because you don't have the key to un unencrypt it. Uh, and then you wind up paying that. Um, and the best way to combat it, of course, is to have backups to make sure you know that your data is always backed up to you know whatever environment. Some people personally always back things up to their cloud. Um, can that also be ransomed? Yes. <laughs> uh, and so some people find that you should do multiple backups. Um, and then of course, just be very hygienic when it comes to cybersecurity. Obviously always run antivirus, um, always, protect your data as much as possible. Um, you know, patch, 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 always patch whenever you're, you're, especially your phone says you have a new update, please update it, right? Uh, I think everything's pretty automatic now. Uh, but the best way is to just combat it by by not falling for some of the the ways that they get in, um, including phishing. So you can you can also get a, a phishing link and you think that it's your friend, but it's not. It's the attacker. And that might be one way that they're getting in. So always be skeptical uh, from that perspective. You know, along those lines, we have a really interesting kind of tactical level question. They want to know that when if when a computer receives a threat and a security team is contacted, what is actually the procedure to block them from taking data or anything that's bad for the company, let's say, aside them paying the ransom? Yeah, no, great question. It's actually wonderful. Um, so again, this is just malware, right? So this is just malicious code and it's going to run on your system and you should have alarms that alert you. And if it's your security team, great. <laughs> you should have alarms that alert you to something is not right, whether it's through signatures, behaviors, it doesn't matter. Um, and if, if that alarm does go off, you should already have some kind of procedure in place to do something about it. In some companies, they isolate the system automatically, right? So they will just take it offline because something doesn't look right. And then if the security team can go do an investigation, you know, they will do so very carefully through a forensic investigation. Um, sometimes they will isolate it in a different way um, until there's some more details that can be found. And then maybe they will unisolate it and then, you know, just make sure that they eradicate the, the threat that way. Um, you can sever connections. Obviously, it's just a network. This is just TCP IP. So you can, you can sever the connection altogether. You can sever it on the computer that is in question. And again, do an investigation that way. So there's just a lot of different ways to do it. And it really just depends on what, um, you know, technology, people and protocols and, and processes that you have in place. It, it really just depends on the place. Thanks for that. And knowing that you're a computer science major, someone would like to know if you can elaborate more on the code aspect of your job. So how do you decide um, on what risk you're taking during any financial transaction? That's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I uh, so yes, I was a CS major. Um, when I interact with my bank, I do so very carefully. <laughs> um, you know, again, I talked about my phone being up to date. I talked about antivirus. Um, you know, if if you're super paranoid, not saying everybody should be, um, you only use one way of accessing your bank. Um, I can tell you that a lot of banks have a lot of fraud detection in place. Uh, so, you know, it's good to be careful, but you shouldn't feel like you, like all of that burden is on you. A lot of the banks have uh, phenomenal security teams and fraud detection in place. Uh, so they should be able to help uh, as far as interactions with, with bank accounts and whatnot. Um, I think that was a question, but I'm not sure. <laughs> It was. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I know, um, I mean, sometimes if like sometimes you might even get a call from your bank letting you know before you've even noticed in your bank account that somebody is trying to hack and get your information. Yeah. So that's great. Yes. 
just remember that you should know the number for your bank and don't take calls from people <laughs> who, who are maybe not be your bank. Um, your bank should tell you exactly how they're going to communicate with you. Uh, and so don't accept uh, any phone calls or any text messages that just seem like it's not the way your bank would normally communicate with you. Uh, for instance, my bank will send me a text message. I know exactly what number that is <laughs> uh, and I know that I can trust it. Um, all right, and, and then they also, of course, say, you know, it looks like there may have been fraud. You know, you know how to log into your portal. You should go do that, right? So they're not telling me, go log into this portal. That's suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> I'm paranoid. <laughs> well, it's good. It's a good level of paranoid, right? You want to make sure that you stay safe. Yeah. And that's great advice for all of us. We're not experts, so we really appreciate that. <laughs> And so some of the questions that we have too have to do with your personal life. And so if, if you're okay answering them, we'll, sure. we'll ask them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but people would like to know about um, if it's been difficult. You mentioned earlier that you uh, were raising a family. So I think you have four boys, right? Four boys, yes. <laughs> and um, so has it been difficult to raise an entire family and also teach them about cybersecurity? And what are the steps that you have taken to teach them in an easier way? What a great question, Ivan. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. Um, so has it been difficult? I guess it's all relative. I mean, I have, again, I have an amazing partner, Murray. He is phenomenal. <laughs> he is a partner. I call him a partner for a reason. Um, we are in this together. So we're raising this family together. Uh, and it's an equal partnership, right? So it's not just on Laura or Murray to take care of, you know, an entire family. I also am, am surrounded by amazing family. My father, my niece, uh, my, you know, my brother, like I'm surrounded by an amazing group and community of people who help uh, whenever emergencies come up and they do, especially with four, four boys. <laughs> um, so it, it was it is it difficult? Was it difficult? Maybe at times, of course, everybody, you know, that has the family knows that there's difficult times. Um, you know, with, with teaching them about cybersecurity, the important part was um, teaching them about how not to be trustworthy of what's going on on the other side. Um, you know, and cyberbullying definitely were, was a topic once or twice with my older two. Um, you know, it's not hard for, for Murray and I to teach that because we're both in the field of cybersecurity. Um, you know, but it's, it's, uh, it's important to kind of make it a part of the conversation, right? If you're, if you're just tired from work and you don't want to talk about cyber when you get home, um, you know, it's easy to kind of get complacent that way. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, you, you have to, you have to have the conversations, no matter if, you, even if you're not in the cybersecurity field, you can have conversations about how important it is to be uh, aware of what's happening on the other side and how easy it is to fall for some of the scams uh, on Discord servers, on Minecraft servers, like all this stuff can happen regardless of what your age is. So really important to have good knowledge on what to look for from a cyber security perspective with children, definitely. Thanks for that. And now shifting mm -hmm. on to a different but important topic, that of mental well-being. Knowing how stressful any job can be in your field, how do you maintain your mental stability and well-being? Yeah, phenomenal question. Again, it's something I think a lot about. And, and, you, and what's important is that you make time for yourself. Um, you know, it's so easy to get caught up in work, work constantly. It's so easy to get stressed out in this field specifically, um, but you have to make time for yourself. Um, and I'm not just saying that to be kind of obtuse. Like, I run every morning. <laughs> I go for a jog every morning. And it's not just because I want to be physically fit. It's because it's helpful mentally for me to kind of clear my mind, start fresh and, and, and just get ready for the day. And it, that's just what works for me. It doesn't mean everybody should go running. Um, you know, I also take the time again with my family, uh, log off, don't look at your phone <laughs> and actually spend the time, be present, spend the time because um, there's nothing like that kind of endorphin. You're never going to feel better when you, when you have uh, the endorphins that come from the happiness that surrounds you. So it's really important to make the time for yourself and your mental health. And some of our, um, some of our attendees are also asking about when you travel. So do you travel a lot currently for your jobs or? Not currently. Uh, well, my last, my last role. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. My, um, my last role, I, it was a global company. So I did a lot of global travel. Um, and of course, as you, you had mentioned, Giovanna, I, I was part of the World Economic Forum. So I did get to travel quite a bit because of that. Um, but that was, um, that was like a short stint, right? I wasn't doing, you know, just constant travel. 
Um, you know, it was, it was more of a, I was on a project, I was supporting something that I felt was really important. And then, you know, I get to come home. Um, and I, I do have to say that I, I, I don't want to start traveling a lot again, right? Again, I miss my family when I travel. I, I enjoy being around them. And I feel like I'm missing out even with FaceTime and all the things that we can use today to feel connected. Um, and I still travel. It's just, it's not going to be as much as I, I have in the past, honestly. And is that when you travel, let's say for business, do you also try to, again, keep some of the same routines to stay active? And yes. Just, okay. So important. <laughs> so important. Very intuitive, Giovanna, that, you know, it's, it's so important to be able to continue the rhythm that you may have gotten into. Cause if you, if you kind of get out of it, it's, it's hard to get back into it. Um, and so even when I was traveling, I traveled to Dubai and it was like 101 degrees. I still ran <laughs> in the morning and everybody That's thought commitment. I was crazy. <laughs> but again, it's just so it was important to me because I was really stressed out, honestly. And it was really important that I was keeping the routine. Um, and so if it is to, I, of course, the next day I wound up doing uh, the hotel gym <laughs> because it was air conditioned. But yeah, very, very important. And of course, not like overindulge because it's very easy when you're flying on airplanes to start eating bad food right or eating at the airport mm -hmm. don't you <laughs> so, yeah. know it it's so convenient right it, it is not the best choice i take snacks believe it or not <laughs> <laughs> thanks for sharing that because i think it's you know it's important again just a good reminder for people to put themselves first too right regardless of where their position takes them and then another part in addition to taking care of your uh, personal well-being and, and mental well-being how do you stay on top of some of the latest technologies and how do you continue learning and developing yourself um, yeah. professionally in particular with technologies that, that pop up on information security? Great question. Yeah. So I am, um, you know, that curiosity that was instilled upon me very early, it continues. <laughs> um, I, I, I just, I need to know how something is working. I need to know what I need to know about it so that I feel confident. Um, and so it's just a constant thing. I, I constantly want to understand the nuances, the latest and greatest, what, what's happening, the, the buzzwords, you know, buzzwords actually drive me a little bit crazy because I really want to understand what it means under the covers, right? So I am reading, constantly reading, um, still taking training uh, because I enjoy it, uh, still talking to other people, um, really trying to understand maybe even if something is very, um, like I said, esoteric, technically, I still really try to understand it. Sometimes I just go to like my network of friends and just say, hey, I just don't get this. Like maybe you can try to explain it to me and my brain will really understand it. Um, so it's just a constant thing. I, uh, I, really, I really like knowing stuff and learning um, because of that curiosity aspect, but also because I enjoy it, honestly. <laughs> It's really great to hear from you that learning just doesn't stop. Or even no. when you reach the top level like you have, yeah. it just doesn't stop. No. Oh and, gosh, I think it's worse. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you how did you gain these leadership skills, right? That took you to this position. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you learned at ODU? Is that something that you know somebody mentored you? Like how did you how did you great gain question. the leadership skills? Yeah, it's it's just again, that's another never ending thing. Um, look, I'm human. Uh, sometimes I gain leadership skills by failing. Um, you know, I'm never going to say I'm perfect. Uh, sometimes I gain leadership skills by learning from other leaders. Uh, sometimes I gain them from learning what not to do <laughs> by other leaders, right? Um, yeah, I've taken some leadership classes. Of course, I think that's a huge part. I do read leadership books, um, you know, and, and yeah, I just, I have a lot of conversations about feedback, right? So, you know, how, how was that? Did it work well? And if, if someone says, well, I think you came off too harsh, or I think you came off too soft. Well, I really listen to that and I try to change and I try to adopt different ways of, of approaching that same situation. Um, but maybe with some extra skills that I gained from just asking that question of, you know, do you have any feedback for me? Um, I definitely have mentors amazing mentors. <laughs> um, and I have throughout my, my career have seeked out a mentor that I felt was important for the situation. So when I first got in my career, I really needed, like, I wanted a female mentor. Couldn't find one. <laughs> um, I had some that were maybe informal um, because they were there and we were all just, you know, the only three females, for instance. But I was really looking for another, like, you know, top 
executive female leader. And eventually I did find one and she, she coached me for, for some time until, you know, we felt like I gained enough skill and I went on to another mentor, um, who helped me with some other, you know, other skills. And he, he was, you know, phenomenal. He really helped me become the leader that I am today. So. And for those that are joining us and didn't hear the, the introduction that I made of uh, Laura Diener, Basically, it's a rarity to have, unfortunately yet, right, women in the field, and especially in her position, she actually was the first um, female CISO at Northwestern Mutual, correct? Yes, first, first female CISO, yes, that's correct. <laughs> so, so it is a rarity, but, you know, again, just the, what you mentioned, the importance of relying on your networks and also learning and continuing to learn. And are there, in addition to your networks and some of the other um, ideas that you mentioned, are there any specific resources that you use to learn more about new technical skills, cybersecurity threats? Um, are there any certifications that you perhaps have added to, um, to your work? Yeah. So, I mean, gosh, there's so many certifications in technology, right? There's obviously a CISSP is a certification for security specifically. Um, there, are, there are certifications for like ethical hacker, believe it or not, uh, CEH. <laughs> um, there's tons of certifications uh, and there's plenty of, um, you know, groups of companies that actually help you with the certification, right? So it, it, uh, it is an expense. But if you, you know, want to go into a particular role, look for the certification that matches the role is my advice. Um, the CISSP is very all encompassing. So if you wanted to learn more about cybersecurity, I would, I would suggest picking up just that book. Um, unfortunately for that specific certification, you have to ha already have hands-on experience. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend it um, as a start, but it's, the book is actually invaluable because you learn so much about just IT security or cybersecurity. Um, you learn the basics and then you can kind of decide from there, I want to do this and then think about the certification for that. Um, there's tons of conferences <laughs> around cybersecurity, every kind of con, there is a security con. There's like, um, Black Hat, DEF CON, B-Sides, there's, uh, I, someone said Derby CON, like there's, there's tons of cons related to cybersecurity and just do a search like what's the you know what's what are the big cybersecurity conferences i just spoke at rsa that's another big one so i was i was a speaker there um so plenty of places to learn from that perspective and some of them actually associate it with uh with certifications i know defcon and black hat do so you can actually take a training and get certified <laughs> And I'd like to do a shameless plug, if you don't mind, because I know we're getting a lot of questions about where in Norfolk people can get certified in cybersecurity. Yeah. And um, just recently, ODU added actually um, an undergraduate program as well as graduate programs in cybersecurity. Hey. Um, and so you can reach out to ODU. So you just go to odu.edu if you'd like to learn more. There's also awesome. majors in computer science and computer engineering. Um, so there's many other areas as well that you mentioned, but those are some that those that may be interested can just follow up at odu.edu um, to learn more. And we also um, offer certifications too. Very good. So we just have question for uh, time for one more question. And that is uh, from Willie, who's asking, he's first thanking you for the discussion. And this person would like to know, saying that they've been in the industry for a very long time and they're looking to become a CISO. And so in your opinion, um, what is that senior executives, the golden nugget that makes the person a CISO versus a senior principal or IT leader? What a great question. So I have uh, not a lot of time, but um, you know, I could, I could talk for hours on this. Um, what is that golden nugget? Um, the golden nugget is, is empathy. Um, you know, you, you definitely are a subject matter expert, you know what's best from a security perspective, but you have to understand what it's like on the other side. Right. So if you decide I'm going to throw in this firewall and it's going to really secure everything, but it makes everyone's life miserable, you're not going to be successful. <laughs> so as as a CISO, definitely think about empathy, think about uh, what you're doing and how it's going to impact on the other side of things. Um, and, and then just keep iterating until you get that that nice sweet spot where everybody feels protected, but also they can use it. Well, that was all the time that we had to answer questions today, but we really thank you on behalf of ODU as well as the Reyes program planning team. I would like to thank Laura Diener one more time for joining us today. So let's give her all a virtual Yay. applause. <laughs> we will continue to follow your professional journey and its impact on cybersecurity at the national and global level for many years to come, I'm certain of that. And I'd also like to extend my gratitude to the Office of Community Engagement for their support of the event. And to our audience, 
Thank you so much for tuning in. For more information about our free virtual summer programs, visit odu.edu slash redes. And we look, we look forward to you joining us on June 28th. So today's session has been recorded. And if you'd like to watch it again, or if you want to share it with friends, and Laura, if you want to share it with your friends and your family as well, you can access it from the Reyes website at odu.edu slash Reyes, which is R-E-Y-E-S. -E so this concludes today's program. Please have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>